For today's critical thought, I was thinking about returning to the topic of UI design, and at the same time, I got a comment asking me for a part two on my UI design 101 piece. So the universe just happened to align for this week's video, as I'm going to be discussing how do you build a control scheme and focus on the UI of an action-based game. As we've said plenty of times here, good UI design is the unspoken hero when it comes to gameplay. When you do it right, nobody will say anything about it. When you do it wrong, people will complain until the end of time. Not to be confused with Star Ocean till the end of time. And for today, as I said, we're focusing on action-based games predominantly because of the fact that the UI and kind of the feel of the game is different compared to turn-based genres. So we're excluding strategy games, uh, turn-based, 4X, JRPG, SRPG, BLT, CRPG, and any other combinations you can think of there. Now, we're going to ignore kind of the basics because we've spoken about this many times. And I want to focus on creating a control scheme. Because if you're building an action-based game, you need to be thinking about how your actions are laid out on a gamepad or a keyboard and mouse. One of the major points where I see developers tend to struggle with and what kind of led me to making this video was I'm still seeing them struggle when it comes to making things feel very responsive and more specifically streamlining their UI. So I guess this is kind of like a video of me being like the teacher who catches somebody making a mistake and then we have to have a whole lesson for the entire class. But the first thing is you always want to have control rebindings. Whether you are making a simple platformer, hardcore FPS, anything along these lines and in between. Because you want to let people have the chance to alter the control scheme to their preference. Everybody is different. But with that said, that doesn't exclude you from making a UI. Because there are going to be people who, they're not going to touch your options or your control rebinding. They're going to pick up the gamepad or put their hands on the keyboard, get frustrated, and then uninstall and refund your game. So the first part about this, and when it comes to building an effective UI for your game, is you need to understand the idea of a primary versus a secondary action. So a primary action is something that the player is doing consistently and is most associated with the core gameplay loop. If we're playing a platformer like Mario, running, jumping, we're playing a first person shooter, move, shoot, maybe reload, throw a grenade. If we're playing a, oh, I don't know, if we're playing a game like Dark Souls, moving, dodging, attacking, parrying, elements that are very much consider always going to be required and they always need to be done immediately. Another major point about primary action is that you never want to associate more than one primary action to an individual button or key. So for instance, imagine if we're playing a platformer and the attack button is conditional and is associated to A at the same time that A is to jump. It doesn't sound so bad when I put it like that, but let's imagine for a second what happens if you're trying to make a jump, an enemy gets just close enough to trigger it, your character attacks, and then runs off the ledge and dies. This is where the idea of secondary actions come in. A secondary action is something that is more or less conditional. It's not something that is directly related to your core gameplay loop, and it's basically there to supplement the rest of the game. So going back to platforming, we could have something like a spin jump for Mario. In a first person shooter, this could be the idea of having like a special reload, or in Doom's case, the glory kill. Now, the thing about a secondary action versus a primary, like I said, is that this is a conditional. It is black or black and white. You're not going to be doing two different conditionals at the same time. So Here's a very classic example, opening and closing something. Are we ever going to have to open an open door or close a closed door? No. So what you can do, of course, is tie open and close to the same command. Or for what most games will do, we'll have an all-purpose use function. 
If you want open doors, hit buttons, pull levers, hit switches, whatever you want. And this is different from the old days when developers just said, here's our entire keyboard, let's just associate every action to an individual key. So you'll have an action, you have a key to open stuff, close stuff, talk to people, interact with your inventory, pick things up, put things down, take a walk, and it just keeps going and going and going. And ultimately, the goal of a good UI is that it needs to be as streamlined as possible, and you want to use as few buttons as you need to. This is a case where more is not better. And this is why primary and secondary actions are so important for this. Because a secondary action can be tied to a same button as another action. Some games will tie multiple secondary actions all to a single button, as with the use example. But you can also tie them to primary actions if, again, it is entirely conditional. So with the glory kill idea from Doom Eternal and Doom 2016, that the player is going to hit, I think it's either they attack at close range or they hit their, just like the general punch button, which again, my memory is fading at the moment. But the, the point is that the glory kill itself is conditional. It only works when the enemy is flashing orange. It's never going to work anytime anywhere else. So you don't have to worry about the player accidentally triggering a glory kill, even though they may want to do it on an enemy. The same goes for actions that are similar to each other. And the example that I want to talk about, both happen in platformers. So I play the game uh, Tasomachi, which is a 3D platformer that is designed around, again, moving, you unlock new abilities, and collecting MacGuffins. So what they did is that they give you new powers as you play. So the first one you get is kind of like a ground stomp. Then they unlock the double jump. So double jump is, as we all know, a very big point about platformers and Metroidvania design. So you would normally think that a double jump would go on the jump button. No, they made it a secondary button. So if I want to double jump in Tasumachi, I have to hit A, and then I have to hit B on my controller. And for every platformer fan listening to this or watching this right now, you probably just got like a sharp pain somewhere in this part of your forehead at that description. And you see, on paper, what I just described, it doesn't sound bad. But here's the point. You can get rid of that additional button press, keep the functionality, and make your game play or feel smoother in the player's hands. And the reason, again, is that a double jump, even though jumping is a primary action, a double jump is a secondary. It is conditional. I can't double jump if I haven't already jumped. So this is why you can tie double jump or triple jump or, you know, 50th jump to the same button because it's all just building off the same if-then statement. Now, another game that I played, this was a demo, I forget the name of it, but this one was inspired by Donkey Kong Country. And again, they made the same mistake. This time, when you jump, you have that kind of like hover, you know, slow your descent ability like a Dixie Kong has or even Rayman from back in the day. So again, what they did was they tie that to a secondary, to a second button. Where again, you could just put that on the same primary action button, A, and it works because it is a conditional action. And you want to, again, if you can't combine secondaries to primary buttons, do it. Because it will lead to things being a lot smoother. But you also want to make sure that there is a secondary association. Again, the reason why you can tie all your conditional jumps to the A button is because A is jump. So the player will associate, okay, if I want to do a special jump, well, it's still tied to A. If I want to, you know, attack a, if I want to use a super attack, let me tie it to my attack button. And you can also, as a, another form of shortcuts, is that there's always different ways of pressing a button that can tie to different actions. Who here has played an action game where your heavy attack is to simply hold down your normal attack button? That would be an example of a shortcut and a secondary action. 
but you need to be careful because you want to tie these conditionals to commands that you won't have to worry about confusing the two. One of the easiest tr things that I've seen developers mess up with is that they'll tie a dodge to pressing a shortcut with your D-pad or your analog stick. It's normally like double tap left or double tap right. The problem is that while this is a shortcut, when you're in the heat of the moment, you're trying to just move around normally, you're going to be moving your thumbstick around pretty rapidly. And it's very easy to pull that off when you don't want to. Or better yet, you're just slowly walking to the edge of something, you accidentally push the analog stick too fast, and your character, you know, dive rolls over the edge and then kills themselves. So, again, while you want to keep things streamlined, you still want to have things spread out to avoid, you know, the player stepping on their own toes in a metaphorical sense. But one of the most important things to remember is that at the end of the day, when you're building a keyboard or a gamepad control scheme, we only, by normally, have 10 of these. So you need to understand how to fit everything onto a single gamepad. Another thing that you want to, you want to focus on, then we're going to take our quick break, is what is the default position for using your gamepad? Again, for most people, you're going to hold the gamepad like this. Your index fingers are going to be on the triggers. They can also hit these buttons. Thumbs on the thumbsticks, obviously. But your thumb can also hit these buttons. The reason why you need to be aware of this is where you place commands is as important as what gets associated where. You don't want the player, and I've seen this in a lot of games, and sometimes I do this in the Souls games, you don't want them to like have to like quickly like maneuver their hand over here and they're trying to turn this while hitting the button while moving and it turns into a case of Jenga as you're trying to figure everything out. And the default position, you want to make sure that the player can reach every single primary action on your controller or on your keyboard. Because if you don't, then you're going to run into problems. But with that said, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about setting up your UI and your control scheme for an action-based game. And now for a quick thank you to our current Patreon supporters, and if you're interested in my books on design, they are available at most major retailers. 20 Essential Games of Study is for first-time developers looking to be inspired, and the Game Design Deep Dive series covers the history and philosophy of major genres, with horror coming later in 2021. When it comes to designing the UI and the control scheme for your game, and again, specifically with action-based titles, you want the player to feel as, I guess, one-to-one -one in regards to pressing a button to issuing a command. The goal is that the player should completely forget that they are even using a gamepad, you know, getting into that flow state. Now, with that said, you may think that a game like the Soul series that focuses on kind of buffering commands would be considered bad, but it's not. And the thing is, when you're trying to figure out the UI and the control scheme for your game, it's all focusing on what the feel is. If the game doesn't feel right to play, then people aren't going to want to stick around. And with Souls games in particular, they do a good job of kind of forcing the player to slow down. Now, if we're talking about a game that is far more faster pace, then you want to make sure that the UI can keep up with it. With a game like Doom Eternal, that every button press is immediate. There is obviously no delay of animation. There is no buffering going on. And that works because the game demands a high skill level. And another point that I think is very major for developers to understand is that good control schemes are universal. There's a tendency that I see from a lot of first-time developers, or those that are kind of mixing genres, to not really make the individual elements feel good. While in my game is story-based, 
Why do I care the platforming feels right? And what you need to understand is that how somebody interacts with your game is a major point over whether they're going to want to keep playing or if they're enjoying themselves. If your game doesn't feel right to play, then that's going to distract from everything. Imagine, for instance, having to drive a car where the steering wheel is on the roof, the brake pad is on the chair next to you, and the uh, gear shift or the uh, stick shift is, you know, somewhere on the outside of the car. And it doesn't matter if everything else looks good, if everything else works. If something is frustrating to play, people are going to give up. One of the reasons why games like Doom and Dark Souls and very high skill based games get their followings is that the game is good to play. It feels right. And more importantly, it helps the player understand why they messed up. I have played plenty of lesser action games where I've died because I went to hit a button and my character did something else, or a conditional happen, or a secondary, instead of what I wanted. Or things feel very janky or floaty, that the character moves when I don't want it to move, or does something that I didn't hit the button. And when the player feels like the game is out to get them, that is a major fault of the design and of the UI. And like I said in the last part, you want to keep things as few buttons as you need to, but in some cases you may need to use all eight major buttons on the gamepad. But again, buttons and what commands you associate to them have to be based on your the default way you hold the controller. Because you don't want something important to be on, let's say, the back button on your Xbox controller. Or that the only way to throw grenades is left directional d-pad. And as another important point, be careful if you have major commands that are completely opposed to each other, either tied to the same key or button, or very close. Because let me give you another example. In Payday 2, during the stealth sections, the button that you use to call people uh, call guards out to when you're in stealth is next or directly next to the button that you throw a grenade. So what can happen or what has happened play in times is that instead of pointing something out with their finger, players point out to be quiet by throwing a grenade in that general direction. Incidentally, I've done that several times and I know a lot of people who've played Payday have done that. And one other point, because I know somebody's going to bring this up, you're going to say, why not just rebind the key? Well, again, that is why you need to have that functionality. And there are games still being released today that don't. But at the end of the day, as a developer, it is your responsibility to come up with a proper UI and obviously a UX for your title. Because if you can't do it right, why should somebody kind of fix your game for you? And I played another game that did not. And what ended up happening was the game bound all the functions in my gamepad in like the most worse and obtuse, obtuse way imaginable. It was like, press start button to jump. Press left D-pad to swing your sword. Press R button to use an item. Press up on your analog stick to uh, open a door. And... It was just a nightmare. And you will, of course, have people who will put in the work and will rebind controls themselves. But most people, the second they try to attack and they realize it's the start button, they're going to stop playing your game and they are not going to come back. So, to wrap things up, can you think of any other lessons regarding creating a UI for an action-based game that I didn't touch on that you'd like me to cover in a future video? And can you think of examples of really solid UI and control schemes in action games and not so good examples? Let me know as always in the comments below. But to summarize our video, a good UI for an action-based game is about understanding the primary and secondary actions 
you can always associate secondary actions to the same button as a primary because they are conditional, but never assign a multiple primary actions to a single button because that will often lead to things being very clunky or the player hitting the wrong thing at the wrong time. Conditional actions are very popular when it comes to secondary commands and it allows you to do more with fewer buttons. For as an interesting example, in a lot of the Legend of Zelda games, there is no jump button because jumping in a Zelda game is not really considered a primary action, well, as completely opposed to a Mario game. So what they've often done is just say, if Link runs over the edge of something, he's just going to automatically jump. And again, while I wouldn't say that could work in a platformer, because again, jumping would be a primary action there, in an action-adventure game that focuses more on walking and combat, you can do that. And again, how you build your UI and your control scheme is going to be genre dependent. With Dark Souls, for instance, they have often tied jump to pressing down on the thumb setting that's considered like L3. That would never work in a platform. But in a game that is focused entirely on combat and dodging, and jumping is super conditional, a lot of people have been fine with it. So, with that said, thank you so much for tuning in to this video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Check out our Discord and Patreon link down below. And come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where he's in the art and science of games.